Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being on time. Uh, and I, I hope you had a good time wherever it was that you went last night. I know we saw a, a bunch of different shows. Uh, this, I wanted to give you a sense of how the day is going to work. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, we use this kind of fishbowl format. Uh, and it starts, uh, each uh, topic is introduced by a conversation at the table. And then we break out. And then a different group of people will come to the table around a different topic. The, the underpinnings of this. Uh, if I, if I do the research dramaturgy about it. This is um, actually a, a conversation style. In my mind. Yeah, I, I have to tell you because I'm going to be self-conscious of it all day. I broke a tooth last night. Oh. So I'm going to be like lisping all day. <laughs> it's fine. I have an appointment at the dentist later. But um, anyway, that, you're going to hear me window, doing that. Wasn't it? I hmm? remember this in Blue Window. <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, the, so anyway, this uh, style is something I'm borrowing from a conversation that happens every summer in the, um, near Albuquerque. And it's kind of an amazing meeting of uh, native elders uh, from around the world and uh, Western scientists. And they're trying to map the lang what they call the language of spirit. And so these great minds gather there. And they're Nobel physicists and, and you know, uh, leaders of all sorts of uh, indigenous uh, communities around the globe. And they sit at a table and they try to find a language bridge between native ways of knowing and Western mind. Uh, and they use this thing that David Bohm uh, developed, which is a, a concept of dialogue. His, uh, Bohm as a quantum physicist believed that conversation actually exists in the universe and that it's, that it's trying to come into our lives. And it comes through, uh, in a, if you have the right people, the conversation that needs to happen comes through that group of people. And it comes through the group of people if we all sit and, and if we listen closely to what's said, and we listen to what's not said, and if we're the, peop if we're the person who has the thing that's not said to contribute, that's when uh, the speaking happens. And so it's a very uh, kind of woo-woo concept, but we've been using it, and it kind of works. And the way that it um, functions in this setting is that the people at the table well, I'll have a prompt, and you, your job at the table is to try to just feed into that prompt the thing that you know about what we're discussing, the thing that might not otherwise be said. It's not important that everybody speak. It's not important that everybody be at the table. But if, if we're open to what needs to happen, the conversation will grow up through the table. What happens then is that you on the listening circle, you'll catch the things that aren't uh, contributed by this particular group, and in the breakouts, bring those with you. So for example, this morning we're going to be talking about the sprawl of the literary office. And so the current range of, of activities that are uh, comprise what is going on in the literary office. And it's, we talked about it as do we need a new name. That's a little, um, it's a little glib. For, um, I, I'm, I was a little glib about that. It's because my experience of it is that there's, we're doing so many things uh, that does literary hold it all? But I want to get at this morning, what are all those things? And which are the things that are uh, most important, uh, that are related to what literary offices are meant to do? What are the things that need to be done and have just arrived? Jerry Patch talked about it uh, on our phone call before we got started. He talked about the literary office as a kind of magnet, and all these shavings just keep um, jumping onto it, and it gets fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier as, as it sits there, attracting more and more shavings. Um, so let's, I want to talk a little bit at what those shavings are. Uh, and so that's what this group is going to be discussing, what's going on in these institutions, what's going on in the, uh, your experience of other institutions. Uh, and then uh, when we break out, anything that we've left off the table, um, we've left out at the table, should come up into the breakouts. We'll capture that. Janice will have access to all those notes. And ultimately, what we should have is a pretty uh, complete discussion of the, what's going on right now uh, in the world of literary offices and how so that we can start to identify the things that we want to uh, keep, the baby, looking for the baby. All right, any questions about that? And we'll go back and forth uh, between the table and listening circle, each of you, and um, 
the sun will be with us all day from the looks of things. So sunglasses totally, um, you know, they're, they're cool with us. <laughs> Please do it, otherwise it can get painful. And sorry to everybody who's watching online, we're going to be wearing our sunglasses. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> off we go. So this uh, first question, and a lot of this comes from, uh, actually I should just go back for my own um, work, why this is on my mind, how it's been on my mind. When I took over um, the, when the artistic development office got created here at Arena Stage, which was actually when Mark Bly left, he had been the senior dramaturg, and the literary office lived in the world of the senior dramaturg. When he left, he wasn't replaced. And all that moved into one department called the Artistic Development Team. And Janine Sobek at the time was the, you, you were still the literary fellow at the time. Uh, I was interim literary manager. Interim literary manager at that time. So we, we sat down to try to figure out, well, what are we actually doing? It was a new um, responsibility for me. It was a new role for, for Janine. And the theater was uh, moving into a whole new set of activities that were, seemed logical. Uh, to pull into this uh, office. And we pulled a lot into the office. And so I've been wondering <coughs> all along uh, what, the, what are the appropriate boundaries uh, for what gets pulled into the office. I, I personally have had a very broad curiosity about the artistic life of the theater and, and the life of the, um, the, the conversation between the audience and the work on stage. Uh, and we've done a lot of work there, and it's in the literary office. I wonder what, uh, if you could talk, let's, John, talk, uh, uh, in, you're at Woolley, mm -hmm. and Woolley also does a tremendous amount of work between the audience and the stage. Is that coming through literary? Uh, I mean, it's coming through literary, it's coming through a new department that we've actually created as well that sort of um, overlaps with literary, that's called Connect audience. And overlaps, and, but it's separate from the literary responsibility. It overlaps, but it's separate. Um, and we've realized that connectivity overlaps not only with literary, but also with marketing. Um, and that each of those departments share various, that we all have dramaturgical responsibilities, we all have connectivity responsibilities, and we all also contribute to marketing in various ways. And what, so in your day, you are the literary manager. I'm the literary manager of Wally, yeah. And, and in your day, what, in your week, what are the <laughs> various things that are pulling for your time? Um, keeping up relationships with, with both agents and playwrights is a big part of my time, reading scripts. Um, it, it, it is very script-centric, um, but it's also relationship-centric, I would say. Um, um, and then it's also very heavy on, on sort of scouting work that maybe is more in the devised category of things, um, as opposed to things that are on the page and are being sent to us by agents or playwrights. Um, so that's, I guess that's my week in a nutshell. I mean, it's, you know, weeks vary in terms of, you know, what I'm actually doing in the office, so. Mm -hmm. um, and what's, what's the bulk of your time spent? The bulk of my time is probably spent on, I would say, season planning. So script reading and soliciting scripts and, um, and maintaining the relationships. Those are, those, are, those are what I spend my time doing for the most part during the week. Um, but there are many, many other responsibilities, of course. Mm -hmm. Who's doing the conversations with the audience after the show? That's a collaboration that happens, and it, it's an example of a collaboration that happens with, uh, between the literary department. Um, so between myself and Miriam, depending on who's the dramaturg on the show, um, and uh, the connectivity department. Um, and so the idea is that we're creating playbills, we're creating an experience for the audience that includes a lobby experience, the actual show, um, and then discussions that might happen afterwards or beforehand. Um, so it's really the, the, those two departments, the literary and connectivity departments, are, are, are tag teaming those responsibilities. Um, and splitting, splitting up responsibilities when appropriate and when our interests take us. Um, so for example, my, my interests uh, with the university scene um, have led me down, uh, down various paths working with universities in this community. Um, on other shows, um, when I'm not the dramaturg, uh, then connectivity sometimes takes up those responsibilities. Um, so that's, yeah. What's happening at CTG, Joy? Are you, are you the literary associate? <coughs> the literary associate. And what, how does that job? Mm. Oh. 
It's <coughs> mostly about um, reading scripts, season planning, um, developing work. Uh, we have a writers group that I love. You know that meets monthly, um, and but we are also starting to explore some work about. Um, connecting that work to audiences, um, giving audiences richer ways to kind of dive in. And these are, these are nascent conversations to a certain extent. But I actually believe that the work with the audience, allowing audiences to connect more fully and deeply, giving them um, ports, of en um, ports of entry to the piece, I actually think that that helps us in our season planning work. Because I think that, um, I personally believe that we have a lot of conventional wisdom in our field about what constitute risk and what audiences are interested in um, that I don't believe are accurate. Right? I actually think that you know um, very familiar, overly familiar work is risky <coughs> too. And um, I think you kind of hear you know yowls sometimes <laughs> from the audience when they um, encounter unfamiliar work. Um, that might just be certain outspoken people, you know, might not be reflective of the audience as a whole. Um, and I also believe um, audiences don't like to feel stupid and sometimes they need um, permission to uh, have their own experience of a play to piece together its meaning. Um, they need to know that it's okay if they can't give a, like, rattle off a thesis about play immediately afterwards. And are you as a literary associate having to make that okay? Is that, is that part of what you're... I feel like, um, yeah, I think that, you know, we, um, well, I'll tell you why, where this comes from, is that at, when I was at Steppenwolf, um, I ran um, the post-show discussion program, and um, I would actually lead the post-show discussions during the preview pe period of each play, and I could literally see for certain plays that were not the type of work our audience was, um, uh, per, you know, expecting to encounter, you know, um, over the course of the discussion, as they had permission to kind of um, to uh, experience something that was new, you know, I could see actually their their experience of the play changing through conversation. Like the mood, the mood of the conversation could totally shift, and it's just about giving that permission. Um, I mean, I think ultimately it's the work of the in, entire theater. I mean, I think the work is not just the work on the stage, but it's also how. Um, we get people into the theater, how we get prepare people for the experience, and there's a lot of different ways that we do that. But um, what takes yeah. up most of your time? Right now, most of my time is um, it's reading plays. And are those is that coming uh, agent submissions, invitational agent and agent submissions? Meetings? Yeah, we do have a ten page um, open submission policy. It's my intern that reads those plays. Those Lauren, uh, I'm going to pull out a playwright here because there's not, we haven't yet heard much from the playwrights, so represent. <laughs> <laughs> What's your experience? I put my sunglasses on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your experience of the, the literary office from uh, your role as a playwright? Yeah, I've actually been making some, some interesting, well, I find them interesting. <laughs> um, just kind of reactions, picking off what people are talking about. I. I think for me, some, some of the interesting things, uh, literary managers and dramaturgs, so in production, working as kind of playwright orientation to an institution. Mm. So if you're working in a large institution, um, having, because it's, it's hard enough to develop a new piece of work. Um, if you're not working with a director you know well, or uh, actors you know well, so it, it can be very, you're already working on something new in a new place with new people. So how can your team um, be team-like uh, and get to know each other so that there is the safest place um, to develop that work so that playwrights feel, some, ha have a bit of kind of insider sneaky information about how it actually works mm -hmm. um, so that if there is something, God forbid, that's wrong or there are um, stressors that are coming out, there's a, a way to know how to deal with them. Um, even if that's kind of like, make it seem like it's her idea and it'll, it'll happen, like that kind you of get, stuff. You get fun. in those conversations. Right, yeah. uh, and, and just, you know, how to, the coffee maker's weird too. Like that, that uh -huh. stuff is very <laughs> helpful as well. Um, so I think that's, that, that's one thing that we haven't talked about because it, it might feel more like, I don't know if it's babysitting, but kind of, it, it's, but 
that's helpful too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Babysitters are very, very nice as well. Um, so I, I loved what John was talking about, this connectivity department. I find that really exciting, being a words person, as we all are. I just love that. I think that's the playwrights should be there. That sounds like the, the department I want to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you talked about lobby experience, what I've been thinking a lot about, about going into a theater, I mean, and, and some of them are as beautiful as, as this building, which kind of is an experience in and of itself. But I wonder how playwrights might be involved in that, uh, the imagineering of that. Mm -hmm. Because that might be, you know, a lot of my plays, say, are science-based, or I'm from the South, and so some of them have this Southern thing. And I can go, here are three things that would be awesome if you're doing a play about science, or if you're doing a play about the South, you have to have boiled peanuts in the lobby, or, you know, something <laughs> that could really give people an extra little, I don't know, buzz, something they can take away. Not and right now, like. in the places that you've had productions, and you've had a, a number of uh, them this year, mm -hmm. uh, where would you go with that energy? Is that would you take it to the literary? Is is your um, um, concierge really the literary office? Uh, so two of the smaller companies, it would be their ads. So Rachel mm -hmm. May at Synchronicity and Marissa Wolf at Crowded Fire. Their companies are small enough yes. where they are the kind of the the they they steer they steer things, so I would take to them. And sometimes it, they've, we've actually worked. We've done some fun stuff. Um, particularly in Synchronicity, we, I was involved in their, their um, kind of marketing outreach, which got a little bizarre, which was wonderful, and I think perfectly toned to the play we were doing. So that was neat uh, to see that. And then others, uh, yeah, I think it goes through, it, again, it's that the uh, orienteering <laughs> that happens with a, with a literary manager, too, that can go, I have this idea. I don't know where to go with it. I don't know if it would require three levels of board approval or if we can just make it happen. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think that's great. I also think playwrights have a lot of opinions. Oh, I'm going to speak for all of you. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> about, about marketing. So I would say, I mean, the literary office of the future might be the way for the playwright to say, please, God, let me help you pick the logo, or the design, or the picture, or the font, or let me, for, for Bear, um, I immediately, and this was actually a writing exercise I was doing while I was trying to find the tone of it anyway, but it ended up writing some, um, some what was ended up being very useful uh, material to describe the play that a lot of the theaters have used, so the exact phrasing, um, which, you know, I approve of that, so <laughs> sure, everybody use it. <laughs> um, so I think that's another thing. Um, I, I've also been thinking about, from a playwright's perspective, the literary department being, being the source of the invitation, usually, um, the source of the welcome, uh, and whether that's something as lovely as commissions or development and readings and festivals and all that, but also this idea of lobby experiencing and all of the experiences around the play. I think playwrights have a heck ton of ideas and opinions about that. I mean, it's the world started with us, so we, we get it <laughs> in a way that maybe there's some some side features that we can add, or main features. Um, and one thing that was very impressive to me when I was working with the Kennedy Center um, was they paid for my earliest ideas. So it wasn't a, here's a commission, um, or, or we're thinking about commissioning you, go ahead and write the first 10 pages, or write a big long thing. They actually paid for three significant, at least page to two page long summaries of brand new ideas. And they gave me actual American money for that. <laughs> Which I think a lot of the playwrights would agree, that's hard, coming up with the brand new idea. It's not just the time to write the full play. Like, that's the hard work, too, is where do I even start? And how, how am I going to crack into this? And so I, I really appreciated that. And that was the end of what they had, their expectation of it? Or, and if yep. they were going to continue with it, they would yep. do something they more? They said, here's where we're hoping to commission you. We're looking for science plays, about <laughs> science uh, plays for their theater for young audiences departments. So um, Greg Henry and Kim Peter Kovac were behind that. Yeah, and it was just, here are three ideas, and I spent a lot of time on them. And I did, you know, when you're drafting ideas, I just tend to fall into uh, dramatic writing sometimes, would be a little bit of this, and then here's a couple bits of the song, and then here's one of the scenes, and here's a big moment, I think. And, but you know, that's, that's, that's hard work, that's real work, that's what, you know, what playwrights do. <laughs> so it was nice to be compensated um, as well as, and then it, it went on to be a full commission and for production, but before that point, just to go, this isn't just the free stuff <laughs> that we do, which I think so much of the, especially for those playwrights who don't have those relationships, you do a lot of work before you hit send or submit, um, and that's, that should be acknowledged uh, as well, the great work that's going on, you know, years sometimes before we actually get to hand it to anybody. 
Could you talk, uh, maybe, maybe you don't have to do it now because it might be <coughs> Keep uh, a list running in your head of some of the bright spots for you in terms of literary offices that have really uh, <coughs> piqued your interest or served, you know, supported you well uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a writer. Liz, what's the literary office of the public? Um. Well, I mean, for me, in terms of what I spend most of my time on, I feel like it's two parts. I feel like you know, I, it's um, reading scripts, so I tend to only have time to read one script a day. Um, but going out and sort of the general scouting, of, it's, I mean, since we're in New York, there are tons of readings to go to, so it's going to readings or making sure other people from my office go to the readings if I'm not going, and making sure we're covering what we should be covering in New York and requesting scripts that sound interesting that I'm reading about in some context that are happening outside of the city and keeping up relationships, often meeting with writers I don't know or having a sort of catch-up meeting with writers I do know but I haven't seen in a while or, you know, or meeting agents I don't know or catching up with them and a lot of that sort of thing and getting back to people about plays once we've read them and considered them. Um, and then I also run our emerging writers groups, which is the administration of that, um, takes up a lot of time, and I do a lot of getting, trying to get the work of those writers out into the industry, so that also takes up a lot of time mm -hmm. as well. And that's as literary metrics that you're... Oh, d yes, mm -hmm. definitely. So I feel like the, sort of the, the general literary office and the emerging writers group are sort of the, the two general baskets for my time. But then um, the other full-time employees, very much part of the literary office, is our artistic associate, Jesse Alec. And he, do he certainly does a lot of script reading and keeping in touch with artists in the same way, and he does a lot of work on the Emerging Writers Group, but then he, he also has other <coughs> parts of his job, like running the post-show discussion series we have for our public lab shows, which is something I, I used to do, and then when that job was created, it moved over there. Mm -hmm. um, and he works on our public forum series and does, and does a variety of other things. And, and then we also have other people who plan our, our readings and workshops. In this, are literary. those people in the literary office? They're in. They're in some other. I would say. I mean, technically not, but I, I think we all know there's obviously a lot of overlap. Yeah. Um, and there are. You know, it's certainly not just the people who work physically in the literary office for us who are covering shows and reporting back on them, and the whole artistic staff. At you know, at a certain level, will get involved in reading a script and having an opinion on it. Um, and the person who's who's planning our our readings and workshops. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of overlap between between what she's doing in the literary office. And Madeline, your, your job, your title's not literary manager. You're not, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it now? Uh, now it's director of the ground floor and resident dramaturg. And so the, a big smile and a big laugh. <laughs> what, talk about that. Yeah, um, so I think, is it fair to say that people at this table have two people in your literary office? Like, I have been the literary office myself for, since I've been at Berkeley Rep, so I've been the literary manager and the dramaturg, and that's um, been a giant issue uh, because my day was largely taken up with stuff relating to the season, so the script piles just, just piled. <laughs> they, they just kept going. Um, and we, uh, when we, so Berkeley Rep just, opened a new play development center called the ground floor. Uh, I've become the director of that new play development center, which is something I'm thrilled about and so excited about. And when we were making this transition, we had long conversations actually related to the submission policy when your announcement came out, twittering, talking. Um, and we, we really thought hard about what we wanted and what was right for us. And it became clear that it was important for us not to close submissions. So Eve, we went through all the, the arguments, I mean, that make perfect sense to us about are our letters genuine? Are we really helping people? Are we leading people on in a way that isn't fair? Are we, and, and despite all of the flaws in the system, we feel like, um, something Tanya was saying yesterday about what is our responsibility to our community we feel really strongly that that is a point of access for playwrights, that if we shut that down, we don't know what else to offer them. And we don't, we don't have a better mm -hmm. alternative. And we don't, so we, we just sort of think that that's an important avenue to keep open, even despite all of its potential for falseness. Um, and we do our best to mitigate that. So with that, we decided that it, it became very clear that we needed help in the literary office, so we've hired a literary associate, and 
her job now is largely to deal with the script pile. And I'm a little nervous about that because I feel like that's a finite amount of time that she's going to be excited about that. Because <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, I, 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 like we all know, like the amount and volume of scripts that you're reading, they're not all going to be fantastic. And we're very excited when we find ones we like, but reading scripts that we don't like is, is a little challenging. Um, so we'll see what that turns into in the future because I'm hoping to keep her interested in growing. That's her job. Um, my job now, uh, I actually get to focus on work that we're doing, um, which is great. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about that. So, uh, I mean, I'm in the middle of we're building a program, so I'm thinking about things like what does the website look like, what the, we, the ground floor is funded by a grant from the Irvine Foundation largely and also some Mellon money and some other bits and pieces. And one of the stipulations of the grant is this audience relationship piece of it, which is actually a really tricky thing because ground floor is about process. We have no... Um, we're, the big centerpiece is our residency lab in July, and we have no requirement that anybody do anything public, so we're not having a reading culmination at the end, we're not inviting um, people from our own country, we're not having a professionals weekend, we're not doing anything like that because we feel like it changes the process, um, and we would like playwrights to just be where they are. So if people want an audience and they are ready to hear a response, then we're gonna give them an audience, but if they don't, that's fine. So the questions are becoming, how do we communicate what we're doing to interested people, and how do we talk about something that's in a very nascent stage? And uh, if we, if for some reason the writer wants to keep it private, how, how do we get people interested and, and, and understanding the process of what it takes to get something from that tiny idea to a production somewhere down the line, maybe a book they maybe somewhere else. Um, and I'm finding this very challenging. So, if anybody has thoughts about that, <laughs> <laughs> and, and are you so you're not? Are you the supervisor of the literary office? Is it is there a literary associate and someone else and you? Now? There's a literary associate, a fellow, and me. A fellow, yeah. oh, who's also probably doing a lot of reading. Correct. So yes, I am the supervisor. And then the pieces that that relate to this uh, audience engagement around what's on the season uh, are those also in the literary office? Those, uh, those are also in a place of flux that I'm hoping to iron out in the next little while. They've, they've actually been living with the marketing department only because I couldn't do it. I just didn't have time. And this, no one's really been particularly happy with that. The marketing department's done a great job, but they're very aware that they don't have access to the art the way I do. And they don't have access to the actual people making the art, so the intentions behind it, the how it gets created, the, those kinds of questions, they just can't really take ownership of, even if somebody tells them the answer. And that's that's been a little tricky. Um, so we have somebody who's sort of she's, she's our multimedia manager, um, which is is a marketing position. is a marketing position but she's starting to be our connectivity person. And she and I are now working together to do things like pre-show music, lobby displays, um, that kind of stuff. So it's now living in a joint land, which I think is gonna work really well. I'm curious, well, let's get um, a couple other things, and then I don't have to call on you. Jump in when you have the thing to say, okay? <laughs> Uh, but Jojo and Patrick are both at the table. They're both uh, NNPN uh, folks. And John. And John. Oh, wow. NNPN <laughs> at the table. Uh, uh, what, what's happening uh, for your member theaters? And are, are you functioning as a literary office for the member theaters? Are they um, so, so we have 25 theaters across the U.S. And their smallest one is two staff members, Kitchen Dog in Dallas. And I guess Orlando and Willie are probably one of our largest members. So it's sort of this wide range of, of theaters, and we've had these, Jason, who's in Australia and sadly could not be here, um, <laughs> likes to call it a collaborative literary management, so we have various programs that allow the sharing of scripts, so we have an online reading room where um, any member <coughs> can sort of upload and download scripts and share ones that they're excited about. Um, we have uh, a national showcase each year where we have six world 
premiere readings of brand new scripts where people can share it that way. We have an MFA Playwrights Workshop with the Kennedy Center every summer. So it's all of these sort of various programs that are pipelines to each other. Um, and then sort of our flagship program is the Rolling World premiere, our continued <coughs> Life of the Plays Fund. So three world premieres within a year. So the play has three separate audiences and three separate design teams and builds momentum to con have a continued life after it. Um, so sort of through those programs, we have a literary management that all of the staff members, and I guess the two of you can jump in at any time. Um, no, you're doing just fine, Susan. Thanks. <laughs> um, but the hope is that um, we're going to have some sort of system in place within the next year or two that we have more of a uh, online database for this collaborative literary management where we're not taking any um, power away from the individual literary managers or dramaturgs and they of course would maintain those those relationships with their playwrights but I mean sort of what it seems a lot of people are talking about this idea of replication that a theater Marin theater in San Francisco is reading a lot of the same scripts that interact in Philly is and so rather than having them read the same scripts we have sort of an online database where you can gather um, reactions from a couple people and then use that to sort of winnow down which ones you want. Um, and I think the strength of NNPN is that there's only 25 of us, um, and so you really know the aesthetic of the other theaters. And so through our programs like the National Showcase, you get excited about a script and then spread it to somebody else who you also think would do it, which is why the Rolling World premiere works really well. Is <coughs> So we, we talked yesterday a bunch, and um, we're it keeping it keeps coming back here as the primary um, role, the reading of the scripts, and and that seems to be the the time the biggest time spent for most of you, uh, and 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 you and moved by what you said about we don't know what else to offer, and so we what we do is mitigate the potential for. Um, you know, lack of authenticity there, um, but uh, what? Uh, I guess what's the state of your hearts around the reading that's happening? Is it is it the is it where you're ex on fire? Is it where you're? Is it the grunt work? Is it what, Delana? You have? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so at Company One in Boston, we don't have a literary office. Um, I very. Uh, forcefully um, advocated when I joined the staff, which, by the way, is it's a professional theater. It's a small, mid-sized company, but our we have a staff of, of under 15 people, and uh, we are all we all do this professionally. But it's all unpaid, so it's all professional volunteer, um, which I think is also is a big surprise to the people in our community because the the all the money that we get goes into the productions um, and some small amount of it to marketing. Uh, so when I came on. Um, Last spring, uh, there was a desire from the company to be more fully dramaturgical in, as, as, uh, as a practice um, across the staff. And so um, I came in and uh, created a, we don't have a literary office, we have, a, we have team dramaturg. It's me and five young pre-professional dramaturgs and they make up a reading committee in addition to being production dramaturgs on season shows and being in charge of uh, populating and uh, brainstorming around uh, audience outreach events. Our theater is really mission driven around uh, social and civic issues, um, aiming to uh, put, put theater on Boston stages that reflects the multiplicity of communities in Boston. So we don't do a lot of plays with white people, essentially, because a lot of other theaters in Boston do that. So we try and do things that reflect the other communities that don't get represented. As a result, uh, the plays that we read, we read a lot of great plays that we aren't going to do because they're not mission specific. Um, and so the way that we kind of tried to deal with how do we get the plays we're interested in, how do we reach out and find things, is that my dramaturgs, my young pre-professional dramaturgs, uh, comprise a reading committee. And we use the literarymanager.org software. I don't know if anyone else here has heard of that. It's really great. Um, it's a software system. It's, it's uh, hosted online. And uh, you can you upload plays, and you uh, give all your readers account uh, login information, and you can assign 
your readers to certain plays and give them a due date, and they get reminders that get sent out from the website, and all of the reader reports are hosted right there, and you can look at them all, and you can, so, you can see like three different readers may have read one play, and then those readers can also get interested in other plays that are in the pile, um, depending on what they've seen and what they've read before. And, and is so, it your pile, or is it, it's, is, is it the general it's pile? It's the general pile. It's the <coughs> pile of plays. Um, we share the, um, the task of finding scripts between myself, uh, uh, our um, artistic director and our um, sort of associate artistic director um, and then my literary assistant who's one of my dramaturgs on my team. And so all of us are sort of um, looking widely at things. We're sort of keeping our ear to the ground and we're pulling things in from all over the place and they go into our pile. We do, we have in the past accepted uh, unsolicited submissions. Um, right now we're in the middle of refining our policy so we put a bit of a hold on it. But uh, one thing that we probably will keep from our previous iteration of that is that people weren't just allowed to submit a play, they had to fill out an application that asked them to talk very specifically about where they felt their play matched our mission. Because we were getting a lot of plays that weren't mission specific and we are a really tiny company. <coughs> and I don't want to spend my life reading uh, the slush pile. I have other things, like I've got production dramaturgy and doing big thinking and uh, season planning and all kinds of other stuff. So we have been asking playwrights to bear the brunt of talking to us about why they want to work with us, rather than just sort of that machine gun strafe effect of like, I'll send my play out to 20 theaters and hopefully one of them will bite. Um, we, don't, we don't have enough capacity to deal with that. So right now we're in this place where essentially we have a lot of people doing the literary work and we have no literary manager, which I'm really enjoying because I don't want to be the literary manager. I spent a long time as a literary manager, as a, like Madeline did, in a one-person literary department at a major regional theater, and it was soul-sucking in a way that I can barely describe. So, um, so I, I think the stuff around like, you know, how, how do you deal with the pile, and how much do you spend reading? Oh man, I mean, I spend a lot of time reading, but I'm reading stuff that is more uh, curated. Uh, we, along with what she said, we allow our playwrights to self-select in a way based upon our mission. Um, we look for plays that are of, uh, about historic events, persons, um, advances in science in particular. And that tends to limit how many plays come in the front door um, to begin with. Um, so then you allow them to self-select. They, mm -hmm. they can decide whether to send to you or not. We have an open the... submission process, and, and, I, and I don't want to shut that door. We find a lot of our writers through the open submission process, in particular mid-career writers, um, Kathleen Cahill, Bill Downs, uh, William Missouri Downs, for example, are two writers. Bill just, uh, we just had his play, um, The Exit Interview, in, in the Showcase 2009 at, for NMPN, and uh, so far, we have six theaters on board for Rolling World premiere um, through that. And so that was an open process that brought that play to us. Are, uh, <coughs> how many scripts are you reading it, uh, are coming through the, that self-selecting? We do the 10-page um, We do the ten page thing, myself and, and my associate so artistic. people are submitting 10 pages. Yes, and bio and yada yada that. You know, and uh, we ask for a cast list breakdown so we can see if it's even doable. Um, and Mark Ruthier, my, um, my associate director of New Play Development, and I split that, that reading um, of those initial submissions. And then we asked, so we usually get between two and 300 of those. And that's really kind of doable, you know. It's not a, that's not a huge amount of, of a, an initial submission for, you know, 15 pages total each mm -hmm. between the two of us. And then, and then we, open, we ask for full submissions. We, let them, we, we ask them to submit those electronically. And then we, um, we actually um, sort of farm them out to the staff. And we have a checkout system. And we have all that. So we track them and know where they all are. And, he, and, you know, and we have certain staff members we know we can trust. We have certain staff members that we go, I better look at that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's more, you know. Um, I, actually, I look at all of them um, when it's not something that we directly um, uh, look at. But something else I wanted to mention too, and this is about NMPN, is, which I think is really important, is that um, we also have an import-export policy with NMPN. So in terms of being our own, liter in a way, our own literary department, we are expected within, I think, is it three years, to either import or export a play from another member theater. So in that way, we also keep the ball rolling. And the vast majority of the theaters import and export at least one a year, yeah. um, if not more. And, and Ritha, you're, you're on the hot seat in the, because I'm not talking about it, 
Um, <laughs> the, the closed submission in that arena, how many plays are you reading a year or in the literary office? Mm -hmm. person is well, it's an interesting question for me, too, because um, I think so much of this conversation is very specific to an organization's mission and vision of what they're doing. And because at ARENA we do also focus on um, a great deal on kind of classics, whether they be lost classics or <coughs> classic musicals and making them contemporary, there's kind of a split of the reading as far as new work as well as many classics that I certainly have not been as familiar with and I'm trying to dig through. So I, I mean, it's very hard to say a number just because I think that it, it certainly happens as part of the rolling season planning process and um, my kind of continual investigation of it, but so much of the work now has been dedicated to kind of this um, relationship with the audience and the engagement of the work at hand, and I really loved what Madeline said about kind of being able to focus on the current work of the season in a way, because I feel like that's broadened um, as far as having more dedication <coughs> in for each show, for what the, the dialogue is with the audience, and then also the piece of institutional dramaturgy as far as what's the dialogue with the staff. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, that has increased. So I think, oh, numbers? I, I don't know if I can Is it 10? Uh, it's more, definitely more than 10. <laughs> it, yeah, no, I probably, I mean. Hundreds? With, yeah, I'd probably say 100, if not, you know, more than, a little more than that. Of submitted, of, of plays, new plays? Of, of, well, new plays and of lost classics. And, mm -hmm. I, so, I have a question, maybe Lauren, for you. We talk about this, uh, the pile, and it has a lot of different um, monikers. <laughs> How does it feel to you to hear about the pile? Um, I, I'm very glad you asked that, David. <clears throat> I, I tell all of my students, um, and anyone who would bother to ask me, um, but also uh, colleagues, we don't really submit in that fashion to institutional theaters, because kind of why? Mm -hmm. I, I submit to Madeline, because Madeline is a friend and a colleague and I trust her opinion, and you know, I submit to Pat, because Pat knows my work. Um, but it's, it's not like I'm just going to send it to Steppenwolf and go, I can't wait for them to respond. <laughs> it's, it's when, I mean, it, when there are such incredible, specifically designed play, new play development institutions, so submit to O'Neill, Ojai, Sundance, I mean, on and on and on. And a lot of these institutions, of course, <laughs> all of you know, have um, development programs within. So if you're not submitting to ground floor, which that is an open submission development, I mean, that's, that's, that is an entry point that they say, please knock on the store. <laughs> Whereas the other ones, it's like, oh God, we love you. Please, please don't put the pile there. So I, I'm not afraid of the pile because I don't, uh, I don't find myself in it in that way. Um, I think when I find myself in, uh, connecting with new theaters, it's either re recommendation, Madeline tells Liz, or something, um, and we start a conversation, or, you know, my, my agent will set up a meeting when I'm in a new city, and I'm like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to meet the folks at Old Globe, or I've always wanted to meet the folks at et cetera. Um, and then I start a personal relationship with them and just ask them specifically, what are you excited about? What's going on? I don't even talk, I try not to talk about, my, I, I want to know what's up there because each institution is so different personality-wise. And it is based on relationships. Again, that's what yeah. I keep thinking, is like, the pile doesn't really do that much good. Now, in Pat, I mean, Pat's one of the few people that I've said, has, that I've heard, that has found new relationships out of that pile. But everywhere else, it's like, let's talk about a new idea, or meet at the O'Neill <laughs> on the porch, or in the, the swing, or on the bonfire. Those conversations seem to be more productive than I'm going to submit those 10 pages. We can't be friends with every writer, but we can be friends with a lot of writers. And we were talking about this last night in terms oh, yeah. of letting playwrights be their advocates for playwrights other being writers. Drama and, 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 and as well. And, and you know, uh, Steve Yaki was, I told this story yesterday, was so kind as to recommend Lauren mm -hmm. uh, and Ross Maxwell, another writer that uh, actually is a friend of yours as well to us. And, at, you know, at, <laughs> to his detriment because they got accepted into our, <laughs> into our festival last year, and Steve did, and he was really Stop, but we <laughs> <laughs> we he wasn't pissed off. He was thrilled for, for you guys. He really was. But no, um, it's true. That's my favorite thing to talk about, besides New Place <coughs> Structure, which I love to talk about, is other plays <laughs> and playwrights that I adore and yeah. that I'm, you know, secretly jealous slash inspired by <laughs> those, those writers. And I think it's a good thing to ask playwrights, who are you excited about? Who are you reading? So yeah. I think you might find some new exciting stuff. But don't we, I mean, I don't know. Don't we owe something as theaters to the writers who don't have the benefit of being far enough along to have that mm -hmm. privilege? I mean, I think you have 
you have a definite privilege, which I think is amazing, and um, also is shared by a lot of playwrights, which is those personal connections. And certainly as somebody who works as a dramaturg, I so value those personal relationships with playwrights because that's how I figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like if I'm not, if I can't find a way to get access to the playwrights who don't have other entry points, um, and I can't find a way to do that in an organized fashion that makes it not onerous for me so that I don't end up hating those mm -hmm. unnamed playwrights who keep sending me their work, like I have to, I don't know yet how to figure out the best way to do that. But that's that's the O'Neill, and that's mm -hmm. the places that say, please send us your stuff, and we'll read it blind, and so we don't your care what you're that, that Submit there. I, I the tell everybody. The shouldn't submit to theaters, they should only submit Here are to 10 websites of places that mm -hmm. say, submit, 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 submit. Mm -hmm. Don't bother sending it to the Alliance or the Major Lort Theater in mm -hmm. your city. Mm -hmm. Send it to those places, and because it's not just there is an open submission policy it's because y'all are y'all know what you're doing. <laughs> like yeah. the, the point is to find those new voices, and that's I didn't have that privilege when I was growing up in Atlanta. My mm -hmm. job, I will submit to Bay Area playwrights every year and O'Neill every year, and I'll submit to all of these places. And that's where I started those earliest relationships was in that context. Mm -hmm. You know, do I'm I'm not also a, the casting director at Orlando Shake, so I I really am oriented towards people. I see people as people and not you know a script or a, a headshot and resume. And we have an op we take you know it's an open casting call as well. And every year I find new people in that way too. It's not just agent submissions or it's you know there's I just I like I like the idea of there's got to be a way to control the flood right. the floodwaters, but also you know qual quality will rise, and that's how the opportunities arise too. I think we're going to um, need to break out here in, in a couple minutes, but I need to get two more questions on the table. Uh, so. Uh, bear with me, and if I cut you up, because I got it out in the air and I want to keep going. <laughs> um, but soul sucking comes up, um, <laughs> and I wonder. Uh, people talk about it somewhat in the past, sometimes, or we, like Madeline, you talk about you have a new job and yes. and, and it, you light up. Um, <clears throat> is is that a condition of the literary office that we just have to accept as endemic to the literary office? What's the soul sucking? Thing. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a... a <laughs> well, I guess I just feel the opposite. I mean, I feel very fortunate to, to work at the public and to, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of the fortunateness um, in relation to literary office is having enough enough staff to yeah. to read all, all the okay. piles. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So I think for me, it, it hasn't been full sucking and I still have faith in the pile. Um, but I, you know, I can imagine many situations in, in which it would be and I understand. So maybe it's a that. thing where part of what you're talking about, Lauren, is Find the places that have faith in the pile yeah. and, and engage there. I love and that. there and those the the, there, <laughs> are, there are places and, and for all sorts of good reasons that theater is called the public theater. Yeah. The, you know the job of O'Neill, the Sun mm -hmm. Sundance, oh how you, you, you named uh, some of them. Uh, and, and yeah, no, no. I just I think that the soul sucking comes when the pile is disconnected from the artistic director. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when the pile mm -hmm. is disconnected from the work that you're actually doing in the theater, mm -hmm. if you it is about faith in the pile because if you feel like stuff that you read is gonna actually has an avenue to go somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah. that's then you have that energy. But if you if you know that what you're reading is never gonna go anywhere and you're just doing it in a bubble, I think that's where the soul sucking comes. Is there also a uh, is there, so we didn't talk at all about this as a sprawling um, set of responsibilities. We, it, this is really focused on a s uh, very small set of responsibilities. Not that they're not overwhelming in terms of how um, much work it is. It, is it not the case that that uh, in the that the role of the literary office is uh, blurry and and um, sprawling? Uh, it, I think in in our theater the. Well, as I said, no literary office, but but the dramaturgical team are uh, we. There is a lot of sprawl, but it's by design. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's because we want that sprawl because we we're trying to create a dramaturgical sensibility within the company as a whole that moves out into all the departments. And I've been really lucky that my that the staff I work with at Company One has been really. Uh, they, they instigated that, you know, I, they brought me in to do that as opposed to me sort of knocking on, on the door and sort of demanding that there be dramaturgical sensibility. But as a result, it also means that, uh, you know, I, as I said, I have five pre-professional dramaturgs, one of whom is in charge of outreach, one of whom is in charge of literary, one of whom is in charge of sort of being outreach on the staff. Outreach to the system. audience or yeah. outreach to the community? Community, community outreach. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and, and the cultivation of events that are outside of the walls of the theater, yeah. so like out in the community. Uh, so there is a ton of sprawl. And we do like a lot of video work as well these days, thanks to Raphael, who inspired us last summer, and Alain Dier, way to go. Um, and I mean, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff we're doing, but I think it makes us stronger, and it actually makes the reading that we're doing more specific. Like when we're reading through the submissions, because the entire reading department is in charge of all of this sort of dramaturgical work of the, com of the company and the community, it means that every single person who's reading feels really connected to mission. And so we are, we're doing way better, I think. We're reading, we're reading more slowly now, but I think we're reading more fully, so. You're sprawling, Amrita, is that just my fault? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally sprawling, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think I, there's definitely a lot of sprawl, um, and it's, it's been very interesting to kind of navigate, because I feel like so much of it is in this experimental phase that we're really kind of testing all of these things out that we either kind of, you know, imitate or steal from other companies and thank them for it, or we're kind of working on our own. And it's really, it's been excited, exciting for me to at least kind of see the different kind of dimensions in which dramaturgy can permeate in that sense. Um, uh, but I, I do think what's really interesting about this whole conversation um, that we keep on getting back to is this notion of kind of the scarcity and abundance of the office and how that can pertain to um, the overall uh, the overall support of the mission and the vision because I definitely agree that I think um, being you know in an office with you know you and, and Aaron and now we have you know Laura and, and other you know fellows and interns that are populating it which is awesome but I mean to try to manage kind of um, you know, the notion of open submission policy with all of the engagement, with all of these different things, when you have, you know, a few people or a handful of people trying to dictate that. I think, you know, we, we for me, it was more of a, you know, following a direct choice of, well, let's try something that we feel our energy really gravitates towards, knowing that it does maybe, you know, lose something in the process, but feels more connected to the mission and the vision of what, you know, where ARENA is at this time. Um, but it, it is a curiosity of mine as far as if you were to have more people just generally kind of in this, you know, dramaturgy literary staff, could we could we accomplish everything or does that or is that is there still an issue as far as all John that? at Willie you birthed a new department to do it. And, and so it's the the way it, you're dealing with sprawl by creating another department. We are and I, I mean in creating that other department, Miriam and I um, you know, in early you know year and a half, almost two years ago now, had conversations about having to give up um, some things that I feel like we were both a little territorial about, <laughs> that we thought that, oh, that clearly falls under the responsibilities of the dramaturg, dramaturg and or literary manager. Um, mostly dramaturg, I would, I would say, um, in retrospect now. But, um, but in doing that, I feel like we have we have freed ourselves a little bit and given, been able to go deeper in terms of what both of our responsibilities are within the artistic department in terms of season planning and, and rehearsal room responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. But I will say that, yeah, we have purposely at Woolly made a point, I think, of not drawing lines in the sand and saying, this is your job, this is my job, and go. I mean, it's more about it, the, the blurriness is OK and that we've all had to come terms to come all had to come to terms, I think, with um, with that, and we've all had various levels of comfortability with with that as well. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the first breakouts. You guys, uh, you have on your card uh, the uh, what group you're in. So the questions on the table about whether or not the the uh, function of the literary office is sprawling, and if it is, is that something that needs to be addressed? Uh, the, the nature of the pile uh, and uh, submissions in particular. I'd love to hear from the playwrights about your relationship to that uh, pile and that process. Uh, and uh, the, the sense of uh, the balance of time and pulling into it a little bit of what we talked about yesterday about the origins and the role of the literary office. Where are we?